So this is our media panel discussion, and today we have Phil Derrigier, Claire Allen. Uh, he was recording the Dairy Journal for 17 years, and she is now a hugely successful author, and she also fell into blue lights recently, because she and I were talking on Twitter about various storylines and not, uh, not sort of... Um, and I'm no not response. responsible for Jerry. I'm no. not <laughs> I blame Gianna Claire. So, um, so David Blevins has more than 30 years experience as a reporter in Northern Ireland and is currently the senior Ireland correspondent with Sky News. Trish Devlin is a former crime correspondent with the Sunday World and investigative investigations correspondent with the Irish Daily Star. She's been a journalist for more than 15 years and she currently work, works with the Epoch Times. Josh Menka over here <clears throat> has covered war and conflict for the last 25 years with Reuters, Sky News and Al Jazeera. <clears throat> Excuse me, I'm losing my voice now at this late stage. He was in Afghanistan after 9-11, Baghdad for the US invasion of Iraq in 2003, the Arab Spring uprising in Tunisia, Egypt, Libya and the battle for Mosul in 2016. He now works for BBC Northern Ireland. Chris Lindsay was supposed to be here from the BBC, but he has laryngitis and he has no voice. He sends his apologies. And um, he co-authored uh, the brilliant break and trauma in the newsroom with brilliant. me. The brilliant. <laughs> have to, uh, it's written down here, so I have to say it. <laughs> and so then there's, there's me. Uh, <laughs> thank you. I'll give you that ten pound later. Thanks so much. <laughs> And there's me, then, Leona Lee, journalist um, for um, 24 years uh, in Northern Ireland. I've worked for the likes of the Anderson's Town News, Irish News, and the Belfast Telegraph, locally, and field producing for Al Jazeera, Vice, CBC, ABC, and I can name all the BBC, not BBCs, but the BCs <coughs> that I've worked for. Um, so that, that, are, that is our panel. I wanted to, I want, I want sort of just to get uh, a bit of... Uh, people's background, why, why they're here, why they're interested in, in this <coughs> issue and what their own personal experiences of trauma in the newsroom might be. Does anybody, before I kind of land it, it's, like, it's been asked the first question in class, I'll hand it to you David because... <laughs> How did I know you were going to do that? <laughs> <laughs> do you want to tell us about your experiences of, of trauma or traumatic events in the newsroom and how perhaps they impacted on you David? I've been a journalist for 34 years, you know, I don't look old enough. I spent two and a half years in newspapers, five years on radio, and I've been with Sky News for an astonishing 27 years. You'd think they would have um, granted me early release <laughs> under the terms of the Good Friday Agreement, but they haven't done that yet. Um, you will probably guess from that length of time that the first half of my career in journalism, there were fewer days without trauma than days with trauma because we were dealing with the troubles in Northern Ireland. So it was the relentless treadmill of bombings and shootings and killings and threats and violence and funerals. Literally, that, that's how we lived. And I smile these days when I hear people talk about fake news and sort of criticise the media, because I've never worked in a newsroom where anyone has time to generate <laughs> fake news. And certainly in those days, we didn't. We were too busy just thinking about you know, as soon as a funeral was over, within hours, you had a reprisal for that death normally. So we didn't have time to think through, is this having an effect on us? And it just wasn't on the radar, really. And then you would go home. And in my case, I lived in Portadown, County Armagh. So I lived right in the heart of the so-called murder triangle. Um, so it was three o'clock every morning that my pager, yes, that's how old I am, my pager would go off and I would go and stand yet again at the white tape because someone had been murdered, there was another family grieving, and you had to juggle whether or not these people were going to find it cathartic to talk to you, or it was going to cause them more trauma. And that was the, the relentless cycle of trauma that we lived with for probably the first half of my career. Trish, do you want to? Yeah. <coughs> Hello everybody, and thank you for having me, Leona. Uh, as Leona said, I have worked in newspapers basically since I was 20 years old. Um, I'm now 36, coming 37, and I mean, everything was great. I loved everything about being a newspaper journalist. As the saying goes, it was in my blood. And um, I, I, I worked my way through local newspapers and then up to regional Sunday newspapers here, like the Sunday Life. And then I went down to Dublin around September 2015, which was an amazing experience because you were going into a different landscape 
praying was my my uh, that was my thing. So um, at that time, there was the Regency Hotel attack, which uh, started the Hutch Kinahan feud, and I stayed there for a few years covering that. And I mean, at that time. I think one local councillor said it was almost like the Troubles because the Hodgkin and Feud, there was people being killed mm-hmm. every other week at, that, at, the, at the height of that. And so um, I stayed there for a few years and I came back to Northern Ireland and I started with the Sunday World newspaper, which is a newspaper that, I mean, I just read even as a child uh, growing up and I, I mean, as David had said, you know, what journalists had to report on back then was absolutely horrendous, but I admired the journalist's bravery in doing that. And so I was so proud to become a crime journalist with Sunday World. But very quickly, and I started in 2017, uh, at that time there was no government here in Northern Ireland, and I believe that opened up quite a vacuum for the more sinister elements in communities to grow. And at that time, I reported a lot in paramilitaries slash organised criminals. And uh, that led to basically me receiving death threats. And those death threats then moved on to my children. <coughs> um, I received a horrendous threat in October 2019 that was um, sent to my newborn son. And uh, whilst all that was happening, uh, I, w- I had to deal with this new emerging thing of online abuse and it just, it felt like just one day it all exploded and so you were getting these death threats, your children were being threatened and you were just absolutely getting slaughtered <coughs> for anything you posted on social media and I found it weirdly, it was more so women that was facing it. And so that's where my trauma came from. It came from, I would say, even more so from the online abuse because, I mean, when the police come to your house and give you a death threat and they offer you security advice, you know, you can kind of decompartmentalise it and, you know, and just be safer. You never escape the online abuse. And I mean, it was vicious. The threat that was sent to my newborn son was a rape threat. And I mean, out of all the threats I received, that's the one that, I mean, affected me the most. And it was online. And, um, and so um, I, I, I am no longer in Northern Ireland journalism. It's sadly a decision I had to take because I felt, I mean, there's not enough there being done support ways and, and things like that. So um, I'm quite happy now um, focusing on more UK mainland and international stuff. and. I, I, I'm feeling good, I, I don't feel the anxiety that I once had, but in saying that, why we're sitting here today is because we don't want anybody to go through that again, and so it's important to have this conversation. Thank you very much for sharing that with us, Trish. <clears throat> very, very upsetting stuff, and all the um, the things that you've you, you've dealt with over the, over the years. Thank you for sharing. Hopefully we'll make things better um, uh, going forward. You pass that on to Josh, Claire, I was having to say. Josh, Menka, do you want to tell us about your experience? Yeah, I'm one of the, the backroom boys, so I'm a satellite news gathering engineer, so I'm, I was one of the guys who would put the pretty faces like David did, it was pretty 25 years ago, <laughs> on, on the air. Um, I, I joined the army 40 years ago, um, I know, hard to believe. <laughs> and I was 11 years in the military, and then um, I came out and I joined Reuters, and then got into Sky News at that point. Um, I had a gun in my face, I'd been shot at, I'd been mortared, I've been under scud missiles and cruise missiles, um, but that's enough about my ex-wife. <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, I've seen, I've seen a lot of stuff, I was in Rwanda for the genocide, um, when I was in the army I was there a year in Bosnia for the, um, for the civil war, um, I was in Haiti for the earthquake, um, Al Jazeera throughout the Arab Spring. And with Sky News post 9-11, we were off uh, the next day, actually, um, September the 12th, we headed off to Cyprus first, then into Bahrain with the US Fifth Fleet World, and then I found a way into Afghanistan, so I flew back to the UK, we picked up the crew and uh, another satellite dish into Tajikistan, and then myself and one of the Sky correspondents, Michelle Clifford, we flew in um, by helicopter into, into northern Afghanistan. 
At that point, um, journalists weren't trusted because the, the previous leader of the Northern Lions, Ahmed Shah Massoud, had been killed by a couple of Al Qaeda operatives on September 11th or the, the day before, all part of this concerted effort. And um, everything was fine. I, I had done war a lot. I was, you know, a former soldier, I was a sergeant. So going into these places, I, I, was, I was very used to. I, I knew the first aid. Um, I knew the kind of things we needed to get together. I mean, the culture of safety has changed in the last 20 years in, in the media, um, but it's still not quite there. We didn't have security advisors then. It was guys like myself who were running the, the satellite dishes, going in there and advising and you know, putting the rations together for the journalists who couldn't look after themselves, which there are a lot of um, around. Keep losing the notebooks. And um, it, it kind of accumulated for me in Baghdad, um, I was in there setting up the operation for Sky in 2003. Uh, in there, the, the, the December 2002, we set everything up. Then I went, I'm out and I'm setting up stuff in Q8 for um, one, of, one of the anchors. And we had two teams in there and basically the, they all pulled out apart from two Serbian um, guys, cameraman and a sound guy who was also the picture editor and the correspondent, a mad English guy who went to like 18 and 20 where back in the day the met, a bit mad. He stayed in and I was asked by the head of news, would I go in? So I basically flew to Kuwait and then went in on the day. We couldn't fly in at Baghdad then. It was an 18 hour drive across the desert into Baghdad just at the night as shock and awe was hitting. So we shock and awe, the madness of that, we had two, three hours sleep at night, which can open the door to any trauma. We're talking about self care, sleep, looking after yourself, fitness, but having any of that without all the stress, um, still having to go out and report. And then the Americans hit us with a tank when they got in the tank, killed two cameramen. Uh, a few hours after they hit the Al Jazeera office on the other side of the, the river as well. So it was a very traumatic time. One of the guys who was killed was a friend. Um, I developed PTSD in the aftermath because I couldn't get to him to help him. Um, we got everyone down in the basement first. Um, the first rule of first aid is to you know, don't become a coward to yourself. So I grabbed all my field dresses, went down down the stairs, got everyone in the basement. There was Iraqi civilians there already, sheltering from, from, from the madness, women with children who didn't know what was going on. There's all these Westerners in flat jackets coming down the stairs, and they didn't know what was going on, and kids are crying. And then, as I went back up the stairs to try and get to the 14th floor where the tank had hit, um, the lift door started opening, and bodies in blankets started coming out with people panicking with Spanish, Arabic, um, just, and there was no stopping in that panic to get to my friend who I could recognize on one of these sheets being pulled out before they threw them in the back of the, the vehicle. There was, I learned consequently there was some first aid done on them, um, but it wasn't enough to save them. So I lost a Spanish cameraman from Telecinco and uh, my friend Dan Taras um, from, from Reuters. And that haunted me. Um, when the next day was when the statue came down, the iconic bit, we had a reporter roving around on a wireless camera. It was quite a new innovation then, and everyone was watching our output. And then I was like, don't be nice to me because I'm, I'm, I'm going to break down. I had my boss on the phone with me, and I was just like so exhausted and just so drained. And they, they said, what are you going to do? I said, well, I'll probably come back and then go on holiday. And he said, look, go, go straight on holiday. So I went to Australia. And I went on a massive bender. It's the, you've survived, your adrenaline is still pumping. Um, you probably know this, Hannah. You go into a, a mad spiral where um, the adrenaline takes over, but you start having flashbacks. And I was having bad, bad flashbacks. Even the simple act of brushing my teeth, I was retching and vomiting, because at one point in Baghdad, I caught my cleaning lady using my electric toothbrush when I came back to my room. So I give her the electric toothbrushes, there we go, it's, it's all you, it's muscle armor. But just brushing my, brushing my teeth, I was suddenly back in Baghdad, and then I, I wasn't sleeping, I was having these flashbacks. So I was going out to nightclubs, I was drinking, I don't drink normally, I was drinking vodka and Red Bull, I was like, the life and soul of the party. But at some point that adrenaline wears off, and I was also spending too much money, I had my company credit card, I booked myself into the six star of the Sanchi Hotel in Surface Paradise, and I was having a great time. But you go like that, and then it goes down, and then you go even deeper. And then I developed PTSD after that, and I ended up having to sell my house in Hampshire. Um, I emigrated to Australia, and I was a mess for a long time until just 
tiny healed those wounds. And then I had a stupid layover to Al Jazeera when it was in 2006. Ended up back in Iraq, battle in Mosul. Wasn't too traumatic, but there was obviously a cumulative stress there. I, I, I see, you know, I, I've had to, I never got any treatment for this, but I worked out myself. There's kind of the single incident trauma that you keep replaying. There's the cumulative trauma, which can be stress or seeing traumatic things happening or having to interview people many times. And then there's the past trauma, which could be single incident or it could be something for you. You imagine a, a reporter going to speak to someone who's gone through something very tragic, be it a child, be it a parent, and then that resonating with the reporter and that opening the, the door to the trauma. Trauma's like a door, you step in, you can't get back out. It's like being in a... I was, I was in, um, in Kerry uh, last year and I was, I was hill walking and um, I was there to take some nice photographs, but the, the, the mist and the cloud came in and then it got dark and PTSD is a bit like that. You're in the clouds and you're in the dark and you, you can't find a way out. The only thing that keeps you going is knowing that the sun's going to rise again at some point and that's what kind of kept me going at the time. You, you have to find a way. You know, you have to find a way. Thank you so much, Josh, for sharing that. That's really powerful, powerful, powerful stuff as well. Um, as are they declare? Um, Leona knows I always feel like a fraud when I talk about my trauma because I wasn't in Baghdad and I didn't have death threats and you know I, I wasn't at the scene of atrocities during the troubles because I started working uh, for the Dairy Journal in 99 so my first day of the job was the first anniversary of OMA and um, my deputy editor at the time, who was a brilliant woman, uh, said, you're going to Mon Cranon today, I want you to speak to the families about the first anniversary. So my, so my first job as a staff reporter was to interview a mother whose son, um, whose ten-year-old son, had been killed in the Oma Ball. And um, she cried and I cried and then, then I felt really embarrassed for crying because I was a journalist and I was supposed to keep it together. But this was a grieving mother and the details of her son's death, some of the things she told me were absolutely horrific and they were heartbreaking. To give her her dues, she did say to me at the end of the interview, have you worked for the journal long? And I, this is my first day, she went, oh, I don't know who's having the worst day of your you had. So um, that, that was the start of it. And when you work for a local newspaper, um, you're very, very much part of the community and it's a small team. So very quickly, we don't have specialisms in local newspapers, you dig in for everything. But <coughs> that said, people are pointed out in the newsroom for particular strengths. So I was very empathetic and very, you know, comforting and, and gentle. So I was the person quite often would find myself going out to talk to families or to cover an inquest or whatever, particularly when it came to illness and death in children. Um, it felt, it didn't feel like a job, everyone had she really hard, it, but it, to an extent it felt like a job until I became a mother myself. And I remember very clearly, my son was two, my son's 19 now, so we're going back a long time. He was two and I was sent to an inquest in Oma Valley for a two-year-old child, boy, exact same age as my son, who had um, hung himself in the courts of blinds in his bedroom. And at the time, the court in the Valley is very much a set up like this. The so reporters, we all sat facing um, the, the public gallery and we had to sit and watch this mother recount the absolute worst day of her life. And some of the imagery that is, was recalled in, in the reports was devastating. And I really struggled to keep that together. together. And I struggled ever since with the images that I heard of on that day. Um, over the course of years, there, there were many more children. Um, there were many more tragedies. There was many more going and knocking on doors and trying to persuade grieving mothers or grieving uncles or grieving communities to speak to you about a child who had died in the most terrific circumstances. You, we, I used to say we were very privileged to be invited into people's homes, and we were, but you did feel like the worst in the world, having to ask that question at times. 
And there were people within the community who would have let you know that they thought you were the worst in the world, particularly if you were covering funerals and they would have seen you with a notebook or something. And we were always very, very discreet. Um, where it came to head for me was um, that my last year in journalism, there was a period of about two weeks, I think, where I went to four funerals. And um, one in particular was the funeral of a, a young boy. He'd had a heart condition that he'd be out playing in a building site. And um, he had died, and I was then to cover his funeral. And I was keeping it together, right there, being very, very professional. Um, by that stage, again, that child was about the same age as my son. And um, as his mother walked out of the church that day, um, she let out a noise that I hope never to hear again. It absolutely broke me. It just, I, I walked out of there, I cried walking out, I cried in my car, I got back to the newsroom, I was in bits, and here's where the media lets us down, and the, the way things work let us down. I came back and I was in bits, and well, you've a deadline, the paper's going out, you need to write it, and then you need to move on to the next story. There's no time to process, there's no time to sit and say, that was really tough, and have a colleague reassure you, there's no counselling, there's nothing, you're just moving on to the next thing. And in that particular two week period, it seemed like the next thing was another child who died in um, terrible circumstances. And that had left me broken, as I say. And then the um, the incident in Bunkrana, where there were like, four children and two adults. Um, five or six, five people who died. Yeah, three children, two adults, um, died when their car slipped onto the, the water and they couldn't get out. Um, one of the wee boys that died was a disabled wee boy who I had done stories on because they were raising money for me in muscular dystrophy. His brother, who also died, had been in nursery school with my son. Um, the family were very good friends of the family, but regardless of how, how I knew them or, or whatever, there were five people who were killed, including three children. And I remember sitting in the newsroom and the editor coming out to sort of, you know, say who was going to cover what, who was going to the funeral, who was going to the wake, whatever else. And I had a feeling of absolute dread. So I went head down, please don't ask me, because I just could not have coped. I couldn't. And that was one of my last days in the newsroom, because I was just done. I was burnt out. Um, you can only be compassionate, you can only share that compassion with other people so many times. Um, and yeah, I am a real softy. I probably should never have gone into journalism and hide it because I'm too soft. But I have a list, such a long list of children, of their pictures, of their stories, of what their mother said, their father said, of how their family <coughs> grieved for them and they will never, ever leave me. Um, I write crime now and it's actually very cathartic because I'm in control of the bad things that happen. I never realized how much of that drama I held within me, actually probably until I was out of the newsroom and until I started writing crime and people would say, have you ever had anything like this actually happen or what's the worst thing that happened to you as a journalist? And when you start talking about the stories that you've covered, you actually realise, hang on a minute, that's not everybody's day at work. Not everybody is standing at the scene of an attempted murder and seeing the blood on the floor. Not everybody is standing over the coffin of a child. Um, so in my opinion, and the world was like, so strongly about this, the industry has to change. Because there are good reporters who are leaving the job because of the lack of mental health support. And then we're losing people that have so much to offer. And we're also leaving people broken. I'm still, I don't think, I'm seven years out of it now, and I still don't think I'm the better. But if somebody said to me today, you're going back into a newsroom tomorrow, I would have a panic attack. And I think that probably always be with me. Thank you so much, Claire, for, for sharing it. And I don't think that you're, you were uh, in the wrong job because you say you're soft. I think we need to be, we need to have soft hearts, we need to have compassion and 
Mm -hmm. Empathy, and I think that's what makes us really good journalists as well. And you were a fantastic journalist, so I don't think you're, you're definitely not uh, definitely not soft. And I think it's really important too that it's not just war zones that these things can happen in. I think that it's uh, it's everywhere. It's in local newsrooms, and sometimes the local journalists are closer to the people and closer to the trauma as well. And you know, perhaps people parachuting into somewhere somewhere else, they're 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 a little bit closer. But thank you so much, everybody, for sharing all those, um, those your experiences, your own experiences. I, I realise we're up against time. David has to cover a coronation, so I'm trying to let him go, uh, go soon. But I wanted to just ask uh, everyone, um, in, in your newsroom, in all the newsrooms you have worked in, what was the conversation around mental health? How do you think um, we need to make things better? Are there any kind of things that you think would help people just even from speaking to people in the newsrooms um you know we're, we're a very unique tribe we speak this one language it's a very odd thing but we, we all kind of speak each other's language oh, and there's almost a resistance to this mental health um uh, topic um what, what do you think how what was it like in your in, in the newsrooms that you've worked in with regards to mental health and how do you think we should make things better the final question just to let everybody have a wee and go with it I can only speak really from Sky News perspective, and it's finally being talked about in Sky News. But uh, I, I have a few thoughts about that, and James and I chatted about this when I arrived uh, this afternoon. The fact that it's still a conversation about what we do when someone is suffering mm -hmm. from mental illness as a result of the trauma they've experienced in the job, rather than preparation to try and prevent that beforehand. I would also have a concern sometimes, and, and this goes right across the board, that it feels a little bit about uh, protecting a company against litigation rather than a desire to thoroughly understand what is going on within the heads and hearts of the people uh, who work there. So, uh, and I think the third thing that I, would, that I would feel about it, Leona, is that we have to be careful, I suppose, that in working hard to protect journalists from trauma and the effects of trauma, that we don't forget the trauma that is experienced sometimes by the people we are talking to. Yeah. Uh, the trauma sits in the middle, really, between us and them, and getting a better understanding of how it affects us may actually give us a better understanding of how it affects them and make us better journalists, I hope. But I think it is a two-way thing. Yeah. I think gaining an understanding, not just of what it does to us, but what it does to people in general will be useful will be useful to us in the longer term. And you talk about us being a tribe. I mean, we know all about that, certainly through the Northern Ireland Troubles. We, we, we worked hard, we played hard. So many people, their, their get out was alcohol at the end of the day. We know that. And that's, that's the case in many industries. Um, but I think there was this sense, perhaps, that you can't be impartial as a journalist unless you're able to switch off your emotions. Yeah. If you switch off your emotions, you're not impartial, you're not authentic. If you're going to tell a story with authenticity, you've got to leave your emotions switched on. All of us bring a little bit of who we are and what has shaped us to how we tell a story. And that's why we do need people of empathy in newsrooms. That's why we do need people of soft hearts, not just those who are there to analyse politics or whatever. People who are good at telling the human interest story, even when we're telling political stories, they'll say, where's the case study? Give us the human aspect. Put the people in the middle of this story. So if you're if you don't know how to engage with people and how how <laughs> their story may affect you, then you're not going to do do a very good job. You've heard me say this. I think I said this to your students when I was in, in the university earlier um, this year. Um, I'm not a fan of the aggressive interview. People who just go after their interviewee because it brings down the shutters. It, do, it, it, it may make the journalists look like, oh, they're giving them a hard time, but it's actually not a very good job. It, it shuts them up. I prefer a much softer approach, and some people may say that's not hard enough, but you can ask the hard question in a soft way. Instead of saying, why have you not resigned, Prime Minister? You say, some people out there think you should have resigned, Prime Minister. What do you say to those people? It's the same question, but it's asked a little more gently. And that's, I think, that's what we do in politics. That's what we should do with ordinary people as well. Be really conscious about how they hear the question. How, uh, you know, do the preparation. Don't go in cold. Don't shoot from the hip when somebody's dealing with the biggest trauma of their life because you could literally tread on a metaphorical landmine and cause them damage that they will live with for, forever. 
So those are kind of a mixture of, of my thoughts that we that we have we're more preemptive rather than reactive in terms of that we um, make sure that we have companies that are really thinking about how this affects people rather than just protecting themselves from from litigation. Um, and I think that's the kind of view I would have. Thank you so much. Um, well, for me, when I worked in newsrooms, um, and in particular the last newsroom I worked in, and I only really realised it afterwards, that some of my colleagues I, I was working with, who had been at the Sunday World for 25 years plus, who had lost Martin O'Hagan, the journalist who was murdered in 2001, a friend, a colleague, they were carrying trauma, and no one talked about it. So when I was getting abuse online and getting death threats, it, you know, no one said it, but I mean, you were, you felt yourself, well, I can't complain about this because it's only a threat or it's, or it's only online abuse um, because people had lost their lives and my colleagues had lost friends. And, and then of course, Lara McKee was murdered. And I mean, Leona was there when that happened. And, I don't know about Leona, but when I was going through my trauma, I just felt there was no place for me to talk about that in the newsroom. There was no one for me to go to. My trauma really only came, uh, it started to come out maybe a year or so later. Um, and so what I think needs to, to happen, and, and managers are so important in this, is that there needs to be a space at least weekly in a newsroom for people to come in to speak about their feelings, whether you know anonymous, anonymously or whatever. Because, I mean, I was watching the slideshows earlier about um, you know uh, people who are hyper vigilant running on adrenaline. I I I didn't realize I was running on, on adrenaline until the adrenaline stopped, and then I crashed and and I burned and. It was not good, and, and to this day, I'm still impacted by that. And part of that is not wanting to work in another Northern Ireland newsroom. And, and that's because we live in a place where a conflict raged for 30 years. We've almost, I think a lot of people are um, desensitized to a lot of things, and, and that's not their <coughs> fault. That comes in, in, in a conflict, and I think like David said, and, and Claire's referring to, you know, empathy and being soft. We need some of that. We need that softness in the newsroom. Yeah. We need it back because there's it's it's been hardened so much that um, I mean journalists are suffering, and so that's that's what I would like to see. And I just hope that and it's managers that really need to, to make this change. Um, that they need to start putting their journalists first. So thank you so much, thank you, Trish. No, I agree with you, and also I think that um, whenever, whenever, whenever we lose empathy, I think there was something a couple of weeks back. Actually, it was a there was a murder that happened in um, in England, and the journalists were there for two weeks. It wasn't a murder, sorry. It was a woman who had gone missing. Do you remember? Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. Woman had gone missing, and the, the journalists were there, and they were there for two weeks, and there were there was a lot of story, and they were interviewing people and stuff like that, and I think they they were starting to be getting criticised for the coverage, for being heartless, for being cruel, and I don't think that people realise that. These, come when you're absorbed in that or you're absorbing all the stuff that's going on there the family and all the things that are happening you're on the ground you're, you're looking for this woman every day but you do become desensitized and perhaps there's a kind of hardness in this there that comes with that so it, to, to look at ourselves and to empathize is will we'll help our, ourselves and also the people that we are we serve in the public josh now is better than it was when i first started in the media the mid 90s, um, a lot of people were self medicating with alcohol and, and drugs. I mean, I come from the army in LA, I wasn't, I wasn't a saint, but um, I was going on deployments to um, interesting places when big stories were happening, and it was like going on a holiday with Oliver Reed in the White House. I'd be in Baghdad and the picture editor would come in at nine with me and he'd go around the corner and you'd hear him unscrew the top of his whiskey, put in a cup, and you'd hear him glug, 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 and go, ah, that's him getting ready for the day. That's him self medicating. Now we have discussions about it. It's a start. We're talking about it. People are talking about it. The people at university now who will become 
careers in the future in journalism have got this instilled in them now, whereas that macho culture is still there to a certain extent. And to a certain extent, it's lip service and it's, it's ticking boxes at the minute because of litigation rather than actually caring about the staff. Um, I ended up in a leadership role at Alan Zero English um, as, the, as the head of field operations. Um, I always saw the role of a manager uh, was to remove the barriers from, that prevent you from doing your job to the fullest of your abilities, not to put barriers in the way of you doing it. Part of taking away those barriers is to enable you to talk freely, come to the door and sit down if you've got any problems. Um, and if we take anything out of what we've discussed today is you need to build better managers because it all stems from the top down. Thanks, John. I absolutely couldn't agree more. Um, I'm not obviously I don't work in journalism anymore, so I can't comment on what the newsroom that I worked in is like now. I would like to think that it's better, um, but I don't know. A lot of the problem with the newsroom I worked in has sort of been touched on here. When I started in journalism, it was very much there were a lot of the old guard of you know, male journalists that have been working from the late 70s through the 80s, had seen the worst of the troubles, had really seen some very, very dark, horrible stuff, had experienced horrible things, had experienced death threats, etc. And there was a bit of a culture of, I cope with it, so you have to, and it was very much, it, 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 at times it was actually said to people's face, or if a, if a colleague of mine would have been off, maybe because they were struggling, somebody would have went, oh, what are they crying about? It's not like they had to deal with X, Y, Z. I think that's a particularly dairy thing. Um, mm, like across the board. Uh, I don't know. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah. And that, that was very hard to try and work alongside. Um, and as more and more younger members of staff came in and would be more aware of, I suppose, protecting their own mental health, there really did become a kind of divide between the old guard and the, and, and the younger staff, and never the twain shall meet. Um, the most you would have got if you had a particularly horrific day was, go and get yourself a cup of tea and come back in five minutes. It's not, it's not enough. It's, it's not enough. I could not agree with Patricia more. I was not in my head. There needs to be some formalised, and not just like in theory it's going to happen, but it never does. Some formalised method of debrief, debriefing, or peer to peer support, or something that is accessible and that actually probably journalists are near enough forced to go to. Because there's a lot of us go, it's our job, we just keep on. There's a, there is a degree of kind of Machismo when I'm a journalist and I do this, um, and we don't and we do um, compartmentalize stuff a lot and don't face it. Um, there just needs to be some formalized structure. Now, there needs to be an understanding that we are all human beings, and we all have life outside of the newsroom. We have families outside of the newsroom, and what happens was, if it isn't dealt with at work. You are taking that trauma, you are taking that stress, and you are taking it back into your home life. You are taking it out of your kids, you are taking it out of your partner, you are living in a destructive fashion, um, and just that little bit of support would make such a difference. And I know that there are agencies who are only well, too willing to support journalists. Um, even there was a, a psychologist from the Western Trust who had offered to offer one-to-one -one support for journalists because he said, nobody understands what you guys have seen. And we went to our editor with that and said, we're getting this off our head. So hopefully things have changed and hopefully they will continue to change. Thanks so much. Thanks so much, everybody. It's not easy up here talking about um, about your own experiences and about what, but I think that those voices are so important because this will make change, hopefully. You know, I don't know how many newsrooms are here today. I'm looking around and they were all invited, but we're not actually here. But hopefully they'll look at it online 
and realise this is a problem, this is an issue. And that these are, you know, these are people talking, people on the ground, talking about their own experiences and what needs to change. And there'll be more people will feed into that conversation as well as, as we kind of move forward with this. I don't know if I'm calling it a campaign. What are we calling it, Hannah? With this movement, with this kind of, I, I don't know what we would call it. A but storm. A storm. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, but we're moving ahead with this kind of, and, and we're becoming, the people in this room are becoming a tribe now because we're all here because we care about mental health, we care about, we care about journals, we care about each other. And that's what a tribe is about as well. So listen, thank you so much everybody on the panel for talking uh, about this today. Thank you so much. Thank you.